Hi, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Tahia, v Tahia Vicalo. Uh, Tahia Vicalo began her undergraduate education in Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina when war erupted, and as a result, she finished her degree and completed her master's in anthropology and religious studies at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Her research focused on Sufism in the Balkans and the history and continuing influence of Sufi orders on social order and politics throughout the Balkan region. Professionally, she focuses on inclusion and diversity in, Muslim Ameri in the Muslim American communities, as well as social justice and gender equality. Part of this has included working in the nonprofit field, in international development and peace building, and education and immigration for private companies. She has done work coordinating programs in the Middle East for the Quaker organization American Friends Service Committee and running human resources for the international Montessori schools. She has also taught Islamic studies at different Sunday school programs in the Philadelphia area and has been involved with different interfaith groups for many years. She currently serves as the executive director of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, an organization that builds trust and relationships between Muslim and Jewish women and teenage girls so they can combat bigotry together. In this position, they are currently focusing on addressing anti-Muslim and anti-Jewish bigotry. Is it? Oh, it's on. Just. Good morning. So thank you for having me, and it's absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, and um, I am um, thinking what, well, how to start and how to share. Uh, it's. I read some of your bios, and I. I'm just very, very inspired and uh, hopeful, thinking that everything you want to do and every, everything that you're focused on. But I wanted to say that it's such a pleasure and honor to be here at Albright Institute. And I feel like I came a full cycle. As a Bosnian, uh, during the war, Madeleine Albright, Secretary Albright, played a huge role and was a very special uh, person for us Bosnians during that time. And um, I, I always saw her as someone who, with such calmness and presence, was, was acting on something that she felt was right and had to be done, whether it's popular or not, whether she had enough support or not. So um, she visited my city of Sarajevo and, and uh, at that time, she used uh, JFK's uh, example when he was in Berlin, when he said, I, I am Berl uh, from Berlin, I'm Ber Berlinian, Ber ich bin Berliner. <laughs> she said, I am Saray Sarajevka, I'm Sarajka, I'm, I'm from Sarajevo. So, um, so it's just incredible for me to find myself here with all of you in Albright Inst at Albright Institute and, and uh, share some of my background and my work um, and um, honor, in a way, the work that she did in her life. Um, and, and I think it's so important to remember her, her cur courage and, and de determination, especially these days, when we have to act in a certain way to make change in what's happening around us. So in thinking what to share with you, I, um, I had a voice of um, great teacher Marshall Gaines who always talks about public narrative and uh, um, how important it is that we share our own lives with each other, right? Our own experiences, our own influences, what, what made us who we are and what is making us who we are. It never ends, right? Um, and, uh, um, and how we connect with each other with those narratives, right? Those narratives are so important. They are our stories, but through those stories, we really help connect with each other. We help learn, we're learning from each other and we help teach uh, our our peers and mentors mentees through our uh, through our stories. So I will share with you. I I usually have notes and then I ignore them completely. So I'm just going to um, take a take a peek at my notes. So I want to share with you a little bit where I come from and what my life um, 
was like uh, when Nina contacted me, um, she on I was on the phone with her and she said, "You lived lived quite a life." <laughs> <laughs> she made me laugh because on one hand, yes, it's quite a life. On the other hand, you really don't want m many of those things to be happening to people. <laughs> so it's, it's. Uh, I take it with humor, and I take it as a as an experience that made me who who I am, and uh, experience that gave me courage to do what I do. So um, I just want to give you a little vignette from um, my childhood. So there is, imagine, I, you know Yugoslavia, so my country of Bosnia and Herzegovina was part of Yugoslavia before, um, and it was a, a ruled by communist party, right? So it was somewhat looking like the rest of the Eastern Bloc, but it was not a part of Eastern Bloc. So imagine a small living room in Yugoslavia and uh, a black and white TV, and um, a family of four sitting in front of that black and white TV. And uh, I remember I was probably six or seven at the time. Watching religiously every week, my parents would ask me and my older sister to come and watch the show, the TV series called The Roots. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, so I'll just br briefly say this. It's about a, a series about slavery in America, and the main character is Kunta Kinte, who um, was our hero and, and who we supported in every single episode. So when you think about it, what is a um, young Bosnian child uh, in Yugoslavia, what what do I have to do with a, a TV show like that that talks about slavery, that talks about fight for freedom, that talks about? So I, that was one of my first experiences where my parents actually made sure to let us know that injustice comes in many forms, and injustice is injustice is injustice. So it can be racial injustice, it can be religious discrimination, it can be all kinds of, but you learn how to distinguish between injustice and justice and how to support something that is important to, to, to really fight for the equality of people. So that was a very early experience for me where I, I realized how, how people can be very um, uh, harsh to each other, exploitative, and uh, how any sense of superiority that comes in, in the equation, in the relationship, is very damaging to, to the society and to that relationship. So I grew up as a, a part of a practicing Muslim family during communism. So how did that look like? It looked like uh, you had to hide that you're fasting during, during Ramadan. If you're going to your Sunday school, you had to sneak in quickly and sneak out quickly because that was not very popular. And also uh, my parents, who were not part of Communist Party, would be called for, to, respons to, to, to uh, re respond or, or talk about what's happening if they, if they knew that we were practicing. Muslims, so it was, uh, it was a really interesting way of growing up, and, and there was such a deep connection with God on one hand, and on the other hand, such a sort of fear, how is this going to reflect on my growing up, on my studies, on my career, and all those things. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, it, it regardless of, of of that environment, um, my parents have uh, instilled in us this beautiful connection with the divine as a main motivation to do good, be good, constantly develop um, and uh, grow. Um, and uh, in my, at the end of my high school, the city that was very vibrant and, and uh, full of 
people of different faith back backgrounds, you know that in Sarajevo we, you have Eastern Orthodox, you have Catholics, you have Muslims. Um, and we all were very good friends. My best friend was a Catholic. Uh, and uh, uh, we would celebrate holidays together and go visit each other. All of a sudden, all of it became a big chaos with the dissolution of Yugoslavia and aggression on the city of Sarajevo. So um, I found myself in, under siege in Sarajevo for uh, almost two and a half years. And there was an experience that um, shaped, shaped me and formed me in, into who, who I am or who I wanted to be. So experiencing really the best and the worst in humanity in that environment. It's incredible that you are witnessing so much death, you're witnessing so much suffering. At the same time, you are, su you are witnessing so much goodness in people around you. And, and um, each individual becomes sort of a hero in your life um, in, in the way you're supporting each other. So um, I experiencing so much violence really led me to be a big proponent of nonviolence <laughs> and think about how do we work on peace. So uh, leaving, leaving Sarajevo under um, really difficult circumstances, being shot at while leaving the city, um, I ended up in Philadelphia and uh, at University of Pennsylvania where I um, decided to study anthropology and, um, and religion. Because my religion, I know that, so what I wanted to share with you today a little bit is I am pe a person of faith, right? And I know that it's these days organized religion is really not the most favorite thing, right? Because a lot of times we see it as a core or main reason for a lot of evil, for a lot of conflict, for a lot of tensions and disagreement, right? And then what we think, to, what, what we think is, a, is a solution to that is removing ourselves from there, right? We wanna look for something else that is not part of that religion. My, my personal approach to that, and I work with interfaith organizations, is that you do quite opposite. The antidote to the tensions and conflicts that are claimed to be explained by religion is really going deep into the teachings of faith traditions and understanding what is it that brings us together, what is the main message, and how do we use that to fight back and, or, or, or explain that this is really not, not what the religion is supposed to be or what the message that we are supposed to follow, right? So it's, it's, for me, it's really constantly ba balancing what I hear being justified under the name of religion, even to this day. Today, we have that happening. Um, and, and really going back and understanding what, what that teaching really is. So, um, so that's, that's uh, something I wanted to share with you. The other thing, there are a few things that I was thinking what, what, uh, what would be helpful today to share with you and, um, and I wanted to talk about a few principles that guided me through my life, right? And I, I want to say that it never, the process of development, the process of growing, the process of building your leadership skills, your, your, your everything never ends. And it should never end as long as you live. Once when you think you're done, you, you're gonna go, opposite direction, you're gonna go down. So I, I, usually, I usually say, I'm still thinking what I wanna do when I grow up, right? So uh, it really is something that you should always look for as what is next? What is, what is in my next step that I can learn from? And what, what else can I do, right? So some of my guiding principles are, um, and I know some of these will sound a little cliche, and I know that that's, that's the case, but 
um, one of the guiding principles in, in the work, in diplomacy and peace building, is empathy. It's crucial. It really is. It can, so it can sound like, oh, I'm so tired of hearing about this empathy thing, but it truly is so important for us to develop a skill of deep listening and deep understanding of a person or, or a group of people you're communicating with. And hearing where, um, where they're coming from. What are their fears? What are their emotions? What are they struggling with, right? So the way we are so uh, focused on what is the next thing we want to say, right? What is the next thing? What, what, how do we want to respond to this person? You are more fo we are more focused on that than actually hearing where that person is, is coming from. And, and even more so, not just hearing them, but seeing how they behaving, how, they, how is their body moving, right? What are you feeling from them? What, are, what kind of feelings are they projecting? That's, that's who they are, right? Rather than just the words you're hearing from them. And through that, you are developing that deep empathy that helps you when the th things are hard. Sometimes things are really hard and person is saying or doing something that is very different from what you believe in and, and what you would like to hear and what you would like to be happening. Yet you have to, and I, I'm saying you, all of us, I think what's important is to go back and, and, and refocus and hear that person and understand where they're coming from so that you can really give a, a, a adequate response and have an adequ adequate conversation with that person. So empathy is, is crucial. Um, the other thing that I, I know this is, when I was at Penn, I struggled because I'm a very emotional and transparent and open person. So um, I struggled how to kind of tone myself down <laughs> So that because it's, it was so important in school, they are teaching us how to be very reasonable, rational, intellectual, how to use facts, right? So I just thought that if I add any, any flavor of emotion or experience, uh, I, that, um, that, that, would, that would take away from how I would be uh, taken academically, right? Is, it, is this going to diminish some of my uh, uh, academic uh, impact or work if I color it with some of my emotions and my, my, my uh, expression? Um, I just want to share that that's what is actually in the core of the work that we do. And, and I read some of your bios. I think you have a great paths in front of you, and I really cannot wait to see what all comes uh, from your work, but connection between intellect and the heart. If there is one thing that I would like you to take away from me today, it is to be your awareness of connection between your intellect and your heart. Oh, thank you so much. Because we are trained in academia, we're trained to really not listen to your heart much, right? Go deeper into the facts. Don't let your, your, your experiences and emotions uh, affect how you're processing things intellectually. But losing that connection is really taking away from us as human beings and us creating humanity that we want to see. And it is so crucial, especially if some of you I know want to do human rights, uh, some of you will be doing all kinds of things that are so important that it's, it's not just coming from your intellectual um, self, but it's you're constantly checking in with your heart. So that connection between heart and your mind and your intellect is related closely to, um, to really being aware of your values, right? So what are your values? Do you, wanna, do you want to take a second and like write down two to three values that you can think of that 
are your guiding principles? So I hate when people call on me, so I'm not going to call on anybody. But if you would like to like, shout out one or two of those principles, I would love to hear them. Or values. On honesty. Beautiful. Come on, come on. We can, we can do more. Yes. Oh, sorry. Perseverance. Excellent. Yes. Kindness. Beautiful. Oh my goodness. I Resilience and self-sufficiency. Excellent. These are amazing. So I, I hope that you keep those with you and kind of go back to them as you continue to study, as you continue to do your work. These are, these are incredible values to, to hold on to. And, and this is something we want to develop in ourselves and also are hoping that the role models that we are following are, have these values. Which brings me to, and you can tell me when I need to stop, but which brings me to another thing and that you all are here because this is sort of developing leaders, women leaders, right? Um, so this is something that um, I learned from my own experience and also from studying anthropology and traveling to different countries that leadership is not one linear thing, right? So I, I'm just going, going to ask you to help me here. And when I say a leader, right, can you tell me what characteristics or what, um, what characteristics come to your mind when I say a leader? Charisma. Charisma. What else? Yes. Community. Community. Tell me more about that. I feel like to be a good leader, you can't just stand on a podium and shout out orders. In order to have a real influence and to actually build something that lasts, you need to build a community between not just the people you're leading, but so that they trust you as well. Excellent. Yes. Yes. Thank you for... Yes. Strong. Strong. Strong how? Like, like even if things don't go the way you plan, you keep trying to do it. So resilience and persistence and yes, excellent. More. Just do more and we'll move on. Yes. Integrity, yes. Grace. Grace, beautiful. Actually, you, you know what? I don't have anything to say after this. You just, <laughs> you did it. This is amazing. Because what I usually get um, as a woman, right, and as an Im immigrant, right, I struggle with a lot of challenges. Because there is this sort of a epitome of a leader in, in our society, in this society which is usually related to assertiveness, decisiveness, a lot of, always a lot of charisma. That's, that's one big part of, of being a leader. So what, what I learned over time is that the strength of a leader is not always as obvious as, as we kind of tend to learn that leader is someone who's you know, there to, as you said, to st make statements and tell us what to do and we follow, that all of these beautiful things that you mentioned are a huge part of a leader. And there are different kinds of leaders. So I work with Muslim and Jewish women, right? And so we have an interesting dynamic. We have Jewish women who, have, who are probably third or fourth generation here in the US, right? So they went through the first wave of feminism, second wave of feminism, all these uh, civil rights movements. 
And then you have Muslim women who are either of immigrants or first generation uh, uh, Americans, right? So there is an interesting dynamic there in understanding what the leadership looks like in, in that environment. What does it mean to be assertive? And what does it mean to be um, uh, strong? So, uh, so we are constantly negotiating this because in many cultures, um, saying something opposing immediately to someone is really not nice, right? You don't do that. So, so you will have a lot of women who will not immediately say, oh, I disagree with that, you know? But, um, but we'll find a different way to express themselves, to make their point in a, in a much more quiet uh, way, with honesty, with integrity, with charisma, with all these beautiful uh, uh, um, characteristics you mentioned. So I, I just want us to sort of be constantly aware that, especially as women, we should be loud and proud in, in feeling our emotions, connecting our heart and intellect, that we should not stay away from our own ways of leading, right? Not what's expected from a leader, especially it's usually a male figure that we have in mind, that we, we carry so much and that connection between intellect and heart is the strongest, um, I don't, I've almost said weapon, but I don't wanna say weapon, it's the strongest tool we can use um, in, in what we do. Um, I, I will just share a little, there is, there is really a lot more that I could just talk about with all of you, but, um, and, and I'm happy to answer questions and talk, but I just wanna tell you a little bit about my current work. Because it is really, um, taking over my life because of everything that is happening, right? So the organization I, I'm leading in, uh, right now is called Sisterhood of Salam Shalom and was formed some uh, 12 years ago by two very charismatic uh, women, a Muslim and a Jewish woman, um, with the goal of building relationships with Muslim and Jewish women because the, they realized that there are a lot of Jewish women that never, ever were in the same space with a Muslim woman and the other way around because there, there are no overlaps in their life, right? Or there is more kind of like almost a, a, a tension or a fear, how do I approach this person? So the main goal was to really create little groups, chapters of these women that would come together get to know each other, get to know their families. It was literally eating hummus together, right? Like, let's just get together, have a dinner, and, um, and get to know each other. Th there was a, a, a lot of sharing about rituals, about holidays, about our faith backgrounds. One thing that was not addressed or much over that time is the elephant in the room. And that is, what is that elephant in the room when you have Jewish and Muslim women in the same room? What is it? Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> I know you all know it. So we didn't really have much of conversation because the goal was to build strong friendships and relationships before that is being discussed because we all know how, how difficult that conversation well, is. However, uh, what, what, is, what we started noticing is that the more the women got close and love each other, they were so afraid to mention anything because they're, I love Roberta, I love Tahia, right? I, I don't, if I mention, I might hurt them or offend them and I really don't wanna talk about this, right? So it kind of became even harder to, to, to just bring it up. So what we decided is to really lean into that sort of difficult 
conversation, right? And build some capacity for, for our organization to have these conversations. So we trained this year, uh, we trained about 30 people to be facilitators. And with a lot of focus on Israel-Palestine. Uh, and I'm not saying that's the only difficult conversation. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, our intra-faith conversations are as fiery as interfaith conversations when it comes to LGBTQ issues, when it comes to race issues. So there are a lot of difficult conversations that we are having. But we wanted to go more into education and dialogue about Israel and Palestine. And we started doing that and had a whole plan <laughs> for this year, how to go chapter by chapter, um, workshop by workshop when October happened, right? So not perfect timing for us. I wish we did this a few years ago so that we were more prepared. But, um, but it really showed us how important it is for us to have these conversations, to come together to listen, to share, and really develop that deep listening. So, so we can hear where the person is coming from. We can hear you know, the frustration with what's been happening for decades, that inequality. We can hear fear that is coming from uh, you, you know, what happened in the Second World War, what, hap what is happening with anti-Semitism and, and Islamophobia now. So we kind of are hearing different emotions uh, from each other and learning how to work, how to work with those emotions and understand each other and at the same time stay focused on human rights, on equality, on what needs to be done, right? So it is that integrity part Right, that their, their, their values and integrity part there that we're bringing into conversation with understanding each other and understanding emotions and fears and frustrations and, and sadness, a lot of sadness that is happening right now. So, um, so we, we issued a number of statements and there is a, actually, I'm, I'm gonna make a little pitch. We made a video and uh, uh, <coughs> petition for calling for cessation of all the violence, that letter is going around. So maybe if you, if uh, we can share, if you, if some of you would like to sign, I would like to invite you to do that. But um, so there is, there is a lot of work in front of us and uh, we are working with uh, people in the region. We are meeting constantly. Uh, or in, we have a monthly listening, sharing sessions, um, and trying to bring uh, speakers that would help us go deeper into these issues so that we can struggle with difficult conversations, struggle with um, what is ce ceasefire became a huge issue, right? So um, uh, words like Zionism, right? The, the concepts like Zionism, genocide, occupation, um, and so all these, all these things we, we are struggling with, but don't want to stay away. Because as long as we're engaged, there is hope. There is something to be done. There is a process, right? If we go into our corners, if we separate, if we just say, you know what, I'm done. This is not what I, I believe in. The, the process is done. We cannot keep moving, right? So the, our goal is to stay at the table, as difficult as it is. I usually say we, we're called sisterhood, right? So my predecessor, the, the director before me, used to say, when you, when you love someone, you can, uh, when, when someone is your sister, you cannot hate them, right? But I say also, like, you know, from my experience with my sister, my expectations for my sister are higher than just anybody else, right? So as sisters, Jewish and Muslim sisters we have, we should have higher expectations from each other because of the connections, relationships, and friendships we created. So um, there's a lot that we do. We do annual trips. We traveled to Spain, uh, to Morocco this last year. Um, we try to go and learn from these beautiful uh, um, 
cultures and environments where Jews and Muslims lived to get, Jews, Muslims, and Christians lived together and shared culture and uh, was very rich. And ultimately, what I share with my sisters, both Muslim and Jewish sisters, is that what we are witnessing now is neither about Judaism or Islam. This is not about our faith traditions. It's not about what we believe in. It's politics. It's power dynamic. It's something we need to deal in a different way. So it has nothing to do with what our faith, beautiful faith traditions are teaching us. I'm going to stop here. I, I, I don't want to turn into a boring uh, talk, but I, I would love some questions, comments. I learn best when I engage in, in a conversation. So please feel free. I mean, this is very informal, and I'm learning from you as much as you're learning from me. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Um, when you're having those difficult conversations, how do you go about it when you hear a view that directly opposes yours, and how do you gain that understanding of what they're trying to say without, for lack of a better way to say it, without tuning it out? <laughs> um, because I know sometimes when someone's really rooted in their belief, it's very easy to not even listen. So how do you reach that point, and how do you truly learn from the other side and understand where they're coming from? It's hard, yeah. right? When people, we, we had, um, a little bit of a digression. We had over the past two, three months, we had all kinds of companies reaching out to us from Spotify to Johnson & Johnson to come and help with the conversations, right? And I usually tell them we don't have like a magic solution. We are learning every day. What I n realize works well and it's important, it really takes preparation. There's no one conversation that solves anything. For me, it really is a process. So it is about having community agreements. You come together and say, okay, this is how we, we will, there has to be some sort of core uh, guideline to your conversation. So uh, that your sp so what we do, I'll, I'll tell you what we practice is that we ask, speaking from I perspective, so I'm not speaking for all the Arabs or Jews or Muslims out there and stating facts. I'm speaking how the, all of this has influenced my life, is impacting my community, is making me feel. So that's important to speak from I, I, I perspective. And also with um, uh, understanding that um, uh, we, that, that we, are, we are here, we are in it to, uh, to understand each other rather than to argue, right? So it, we're not trying to convince each other into something. We're expressing where we're coming from, what our feelings are. So it is easy. And, and some groups, I'll say, also find like list of terms that they don't want mentioned, <laughs> right? Triggering, triggering words, right? But uh, I am, personally, I'm not opposed to hearing those words because then what you, what, the other day we had a conversation, I had a conversation in Philadelphia community with um, Jewish and Muslim leaders and um, one of the, we talked about Zionism, right? So it's important to go back to the person that mentioned it and say, can you tell me more what Zionism means to you? Right? What, what does it mean to you in your life? And, and hearing that person then explain, it really gives you much more perspective into, or, or we have a young woman who uh, is Palestinian who explained to us from the river uh, to the sea, what does it mean to her, right? So, and, and we had like few rabbis nodding as she was explaining. So it's really important to hear where that person is coming from rather than when you throw in these terms, right? They can mean anything. And, and just to say what I try to do in, in my organization is to move away from anti-Semitism and Islamophobia 
which are huge concepts that are loaded with all kinds of meanings and political manipulations, what I uh, am insisting that we use anti-Muslim, anti-Jewish bigotry, right? Because then it brings us back to that human level, to who we are as, as human beings, rather than part of this, these big concepts that we either have to attack or defend. That's, I, hope, I hope that helps, but these are just few few tools that are being used. Yes. Oh, oh, my pleasure. You. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm just wondering, so with the rise of social media and also performative activism, do you think that the general public is becoming more desensitized to like, these different conflicts once they're no longer a trend? And if so, how do we keep people's attention on what's happening in Palestine? Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm forgetting this. Um, I, I need to brush up on my language, performative activism. And that, that was it. That was a strong one. Um, so um, it's not different, really, from I, I'm. I'm sorry to say this. During my youth, <laughs> many moons ago, um, we used to call it CNN effect, right? That which meant as long as CNN is interested and it's top of the news every day, people are there. People are following. When CNN moves to the next thing, it's a, the, the same intensity of the conflict can be happening, but if they're not covering, you know? So I don't, it's in human nature to really get used. I'll tell you, we, I got used living under siege. You know, human beings are very adaptable, right? We find a way to survive. We find a way to adapt. We find a way to function, right? So... Um, so th this is not a new thing when, when things are happening. What's important, what's different now is the such enormous amount of information that is available, right? Before we did dependent on CNN, right? <laughs> to tell us what's going on. Now you have TikTok, right? So it's, uh, it's and I am, I'm amazed by uh, passion of young people. And I know there is per performative activism in there, and that's, uh, that is a piece that I, I know sometimes is hard. But, uh, but keeping, it, keeping it going, the, keeping that conversation, keeping it there is so important, right? And I think it's continuing to be a conversation because of these young people and of the different social media that are happening. Now, it's a double-edged sword, right? You get all kinds of things. And, and um, one thing that, you know, I, I will give you an example. During the war, my father, um, would, when we had electricity, right, the first thing he would do is turn on the TV, Serb TV, so the, 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 the and he, he would sit and listen. And I remember, since I was younger, I would be like, oh, why in the world are you doing this? This is like hurting my soul. It's like, no, no, this is important. It's so important to understand different ways of thinking and for this. And he taught me that really we need to get out of our every day. My feed is the same that I get, right? I get the same information. However, I go and look for other things that I just want to understand. It's not easy, right? Reading the, this information, sometimes you have like, your, your stomach hurts, right? But it's helping to understand and it's helping how we form our activities, how we form our actions, how we go forward. So I, don't, I really don't have a, a, a one, one way of keeping it alive or keeping it going on, but I, I do believe that that what's going on right now is so intense and that so many people feel so strongly about that um, it's important to keep the conversation going and also hear different voices, right? Make sure that you go into different sources. Yes, go ahead. Um, sorry, no, no. In your discussion, um, you talked about how the existing love that you had in this like sisterhood that 
your the Salam Shalom group was able to create and how that existing love and the existing values that you had helped you guide your discussions. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I think that's as beautiful and I think that the conversation surrounding topics like these are really important. But um, at the same time, the more important discussions are happening as well, like at pol politics level, right? Sure. So how do we, in your experience, engaging with the sisterhood type of situation, how do you suggest people engage with conversation and have that same type of success at a political level? Because right now what we see is like protests, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I guess, yeah, just like more, I was wondering if you could um, offer like some sort of advice or clarity on how we engage in conversations at that higher level um, and with things like institutions and governments, yeah. Thank you for for that question, and and I'm 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 relying on all of you because that's why you're here, <laughs> right? You all are getting trained and educated and getting these skills. Hopefully, you'll go out there and and do this work of reaching out to that level. But uh, it is hard. It really is hard to um, when you have uh, uh, you know what we. Usually, when we are together, Jewish and Muslim sisters, we say, you know, it's not uh, Jews or Israelis, it's the government, right? It's the Israeli government, or it's not. So it, it really is this who is in power and what are they dictating, and how do you balance that out, right? I think what, in for us here in the US, uh, I mean, I, and I'm a big, I keep saying this, uh, even though it sounds like, yes, a bunch of Jewish and Muslim women are getting together in the U.S., uh, I think a lot of solutions are going to come from here, right? Our conversations, our understanding, our persistence in trying to get to the core of the issue, and with understanding that we all want to have a nice life, we all ha want to have a country to live in, we all have to want to have shelter and food and access to resources, right? So that's what we want to see for all people, right? But our engagement here in this country is so crucial, so crucial, because it is the U.S., you know, as I said, when Secretary Albright voted for action in Bosnia and uh, NATO acting in, in um, when Serbia was uh, uh, attacking Kosovo, was huge, right, and affected us directly. So there are a lot of actions here that we need to keep thinking as we vote, as we reach out to our representatives, as we call, as we do our work publicly to make sure that we're expressing that this is, you know, uh, this is not what we want. We want a different thing, right? Or it, this is what we want, right? Uh, in support of that. I, I don't know if I, um, if, there is, if I answered your question, but that's, that's, I think we all carry so much responsibility living in this society and in this country to really uh, be uh, active through whichever way. Not everybody's an activist. Not everybody's a diplomat. We all have our own ways of acting and making difference. I'm Jules. Um, I really appreciate your talk, and I think often we shy away from including emotional perspectives, and it's what really makes us human, and so I think it's really important in connecting with people from different perspectives. Um, but I think a lot of times tolerance isn't a guaranteed cultural norm, and I think more often than not, combativeness is more accepted and more prevalent, especially in American culture. And I think when you come to these really differing um, issues, such as like abortion rights, LGBTQ+, um, what do you do when cultural values or emotions conflict in such ways that halter progress or connection or even just basic understanding? Because after you have these conversations, there's no, you can't control afterward. And if people aren't immediately tolerant, I'm just, I'm not sure what there is to do because we're not trying to even change perspectives. Sometimes we just need tolerance. But on the other, sorry, on the other note, you can't always be tolerant. Yeah. Wow, that, that, that's a great question. That's a, that's a, I need to take a moment <laughs> to think about it. Um, one of the things that I 
meant to mention, but didn't because I kind of go off tangents, is patience, right? I, and, I, and I'm not throwing this word just as a, yet another um, concept that we need to think about. I don't believe, I don't think that anything in human history happened overnight, right? And I think understanding that everything is a process and that, that what's happening is a supposed to resolve itself, or we need to resolve it, but over time. Um, sometimes it's very hard to watch, right? And to be witnessing, as you said. And, I, and I'm impressed that you use tolerance. Tolerance is like the lowest denominator, right? <laughs> In these issues. So tolerance is a basic thing we can ask from each other. But I think what is important is constantly checking with yourself where, where you are at in your own inner polarization, right? And working with your own inner polarization because when you act out of anger and frustration, it's very hard. You do, you're not hearing a person and the person is not hearing you anymore. So going back and understanding that it is a process and not, not giving up, that's, you know, so many times, so many times I turned around in, in different situations in my life, I'm like, eh. What's the point, <laughs> right? We, come, we wake up in the morning sometimes and just think like, okay, this, all of this sucks. But, um, but then you, you, you get up, usually what I do is like, okay, but what is it for me today to do about this, right? What is that one thing? Is it calling one person to talk about something? Is it reaching out to one person? Is it, so what is it? for me, that I can do in this process. And it's a cumulative effect, right? So I don't think, and pendulum swings back and forth, right? When you look at how societies go, that um, sometimes we go to one extreme and then we go to another extreme, but it's a process of constantly trying to balance and going to that inner balance and understanding what is it, that one thing for you today to do on that issue is I think where, where it has to go every time you think about that. Thank you. Um, hi, thank you for, for sharing your time. I resonated with what you said earlier in your, in your presentation about reconciling the academic, the intellect, and, and sort of more of the emotional, the, the sort of the things of the heart. Um, and as a student and as someone who's sort of spiritual and uh, commitment to sort of fundamental, fundamental principles of, of, of humanitarianism is sort of inextricable from like my form of logic and reasoning. How have, um, I've, I've, I've found it sort of difficult to, to, uh, to articulate that in you know, papers. I, I find that the academic, uh, vocabulary, at least the, that I'm familiar with, sort of doesn't lend space to that. So how have you learned to, to articulate uh, sort of some of those more emotional concepts uh, in, in an academic sphere? Wow. Um, I think I was just, you and uh, Amara is my good friend. <laughs> so we, we constantly have this conversation. So I think that goes with something, you know, I was just sharing. So I tried to play by the rules of academics, and it, it was so suffocating to me. <laughs> not, not that, I, I mean, academics are important. And, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a big part of what we need to do. But um, it was very hard for me to be expressive enough be understanding enough, reach out to people, and, and uh, uh, that it's really learning about yourself more. This is how, when I look back now, it's really learning about myself and understanding how I function, right? And to be confident in that my own connection between mind and heart, right? Because 
people sometimes will want to uh, sort of uh, uh, minimize what you're saying or impact by saying, oh, she, you know, it's coming from anger or it's coming from emotion or it's coming, or she's, she's too sensitive. Great, I am sensitive, right? I'm a human being, I feel, and one of popular people, Brene Brown, says that the power of vulnerability, I love that. I mean, it became almost a cliche, but it really helped us to say, yes, there is power in sharing that heart and emotion. And um, of course, it's, it's important to, to be supported by your research and you know th everything else. So it's kind of a nice balance. But, um, but trying to kind of just be with that sort of uh, a rational, intellectual perspective when you're dealing with human beings, right? When you're dealing with, um, uh, when I worked in the field with humanitarian aid, but so I worked with during Iraq war, war during, uh, was in Palestine and Israel, and um, you know, you learn all these methods, how you do humanitarian, how humanitarian field works, right? And uh, yes, it's one thing on the paper, right? There are all kinds of case studies, there's all, uh, all kinds of uh, instructions, but until you get into the same room with a family that just left their country, and you sit with them and feel them deeply, you, you cannot, you can act in a very artificial way and do things, but until you have that experience of connection and using your heart, it, it doesn't feel complete. Right, so I learned that the, my, my best work always was done when I, and I love people, so I love sitting and talking to people and understanding where they're coming from, and that always made me do more. Do, do more research, do more reaching out. That, that was the driving force, rather than some great study on how to perform humanitarian aid in a crisis zone, right, conflict zone. Hi, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Um, I kind of feel like a two-part question. So first of all, like a lot of times in these conversations, like the burden of education can sometimes be on the people actually being affected. And I've seen this like, like in this case with like Palestinians having to like defend their humanity or like convince people why they should care about them. And then, so I guess like, how do you kind of navigate that? Because a lot of time that is unfair to like ask in any type of conversation for the people actually being affected to then have to like justify and educate when there are like resources out there. And then on the other hand, like how do you think, like this might be a little pessimistic, but a lot of time like there are people who like consume like media or things like that and they have like these preconceived notions or stereotypes. And at some point, like just hearing them talk is more harmful to you because it's just like you're hearing the same things like over and over. So is there like a point where like you kind of have to take a step back for, your own, for like your own sake? Or like is that something where it's like you should like you know persevere? Is that somewhere where you should like kind of take like not? Great question, great question. And, and I, I'm awful with doing this <laughs> because I push myself until I break, but I don't do that. I think it's very important to, and I'm learning at older age that it's crucial to do that. And um, what I started doing even when I get a lot of emails that are very opposed to something, for example, that, you know, my statement that I put out there, or, so I got a lot of fe good feedback, but also very negative feedback. So um, in the morning, there were mornings when I opened my email and I go, uh, cannot read that one now, cannot read that one now. <laughs> so, so I just kind of take my time, and when I, when I feel like I'm in, in that space where, that, I can he that I can actually read without getting very upset or sad or angry or whatever it is, or even if I do, I have enough capacity to work through those emotions, right? Because there are days when I, I don't have much capacity to do that. So stepping back 
and really processing. And I always go back to check in with yourself. Inner peace, and I don't mean like Zen mode and you're on top of a mountain and everything is in harmony. I mean your, your balance, inner balance is crucial. And if, if, if that's not in a good place, you cannot be productive. You cannot respond properly, you cannot work. So it's so important, whatever it is, if it's your prayers, spend time in, in your prayer. If it's meditation, if it's walk, if it's not reading news for three days, right? You, you won't miss much. And yes, it is urgent, but you an indiv as an indiv individual need to be uh, in the right place and m uh, mindset to be productive. So it's so important to have that distance and create that distance for yourself. I, 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 if, I, was, that, was that what you were asking or is there more? They said there, were two, there was a two part question, so I don't know if I. Yeah, that answered the second part. The first part was just more like burden of education, like that kind of thing. Ah, yes, I knew there was something else. Yes, it, that's hard. That is hard. Uh, I, I know that, uh, you know, when, when I was younger and, and, which was very recently, um, <laughs> um, I, you know what, I, I was asked to speak for all Muslim women in the world, right? No, thank you. That's not my role. I am here to tell you about my experience about my understanding and inter in inter interpretation of my, of my faith tradition, because anybody, my friend can have a completely different view on, on some of the things we're both learning. And I am not here to speak to, because we know that culture, experience, life, environment, geopolitical context, all of these influence who you are as a person. So for, for me to be educated on a particular thing, and a thing is impossible. However, it is important for us to be educated as much as possible so we're ready to engage. So we're ready to have a conversation, right? So that we're not necessarily obliged to educate, but you want to share your knowledge, right? And it's important that your knowledge is, is rich so that you can engage in that conversation. But not especially that in many ways people feel like they have to be apologetic. They first have to apologize for something and then go into. Um, it's important to recognize that injustice is injustice, whether it comes from a Muslim community or Jewish community or Christian community. But I'm not going to be apologizing for a remote community that maybe practices same faith as I do. Right, because it's, it, it's not my job. My job is to be educated and practice the way I think. I, I should be practiced and engage with my peers, with my friends in a conversation. I think, um, thanks again for your, your talk and just taking the time to answer all of these questions. I think my question kind of builds off a lot of other people's questions and I think Jules, your question could, could you just bring the mic closer to, sorry. Sure, is this better? Yeah, thank you. I guess my question is, you've talked a lot about having these conversations, but what I've been seeing happen on campuses and what I've been seeing happen just even across the political spectrum is if these conversations fail or there is only a half-hearted attempt at a conversation, resentment builds really, 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 really strongly. and what. Again, this is maybe just a personal observation, but resentment is a really hard emotion to get rid of. And it means that it's not just that people can't have these conversations, there's a lack of willingness to have these conversations. And I was wondering how, when a community is fractured and when that resentment has built so high, other than forcing people to be locked in a room for 10 hours and talk, how do you work past that really just strong resentment. If I had a good answer to that, I think we would be able <laughs> to solve many things. That's, 
That's the hardest part. It really is the hardest part. When that resentment, and I, I usually say polarization, right? Really what happens is, is people stepping, stepping away from the issues, right? Because it's overwhelming. Not only are you overwhelmed, but you're so resentful that you cannot hear one more thing. And you kind of keep, keep push, the two sides are being pushed into further and further away, right? Into two opposite cor corners. And it is, it is a hard thing, uh, again, for me, um, what I do, and I can just speak for myself here, is that I go back to my own biases, my own misunderstandings, my own passions, right? I, I go back to what is it that, why am I feeling so strongly about this, right? And is it connected to my values? How do I work on this in a way that, I'm, I'm <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a trivial way to say, I'm building the bridge, right? How do I build that bridge? Because without it, we really are gonna continue going on two parallel highways with no meeting point, right? And um, for me, it is really always going back to what is my role and what I can do. And when I feel that I, I, have, I am saturated with anger and frustration, I step back and try to think. You know, I, I find it's so important to find, I don't want to say excuses, but explanations for someone's behavior many times so you can keep reaching out, right? The more you understand where people are coming from in these difficult situations. Sometimes it's not possible because, you know, I lived in, uh, through something where that person had completely different opinion on the hill and was shooting with a sniper at me, right? So there's no communication there, right? That th those situations exist as well. But in our context, going back to seeing where you are at, what is it that you can do? Sometimes it honestly, I know this sounds awful, but do you want to be right or you want to be happy? And you can put, instead of happiness, you can put successful or have peace or have, uh, so it is not about always who's right, who's wrong. It's about how do we repair this so that majority of people have equality, majority of people have equity, have access to resources so that we can have normal life. That's the best I can do to that question. It's a tough one. We have time for one more question. Thank you for coming to talk to us. Uh, I would like to ask about how dialogues, healthy dialogues, have been difficult to facilitate at institutions of higher education in the US, mm -hmm. whether it's from an unwillingness of students to listen to each other or from a hostility on part of the university administration. And so I would like to ask, what advice do you have for fostering productive discussions in a hostile institutional environment? Um, you know, I was, I was listening to the news last night while driving from Philadelphia to Boston. And, um, hearing about this whole campaign, how to discredit higher uh, ed institutions and sue. F and it made me, on one hand, made me very angry. On the other hand, it made me so sad. I was so sad thinking that these institutions, when you look in history, academic institutions were the, the hub of forward thinking, of innovation, of sharing ideas and thoughts and and where we are at right now is a very pitiful state for 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 higher ed the way this the, the things are um, i am i am i i really don't know at this point i mean i am a little disheartened by the whole uh but what happened with harvard and penn and 
MIT and all these institutions and, and how it, things are going. Um, I think it really is, uh, is going to be a lot of um, push and pull, a lot of battle of powers, right? The, the journalist that was talking about this last night said, um, this guy who's launching this campaign it has so much money and he's so ruthless and he's going to go for years. But then they said, but you know what? Higher ed institutions have money too and they have a lot of brains and they have a lot of capacity. So I'm a, I always want to look at positive and see in each of these higher ed institutions you have a group of people who are carriers of that integrity and academia as, as it should be, right? And, and I don't think they'll give up, right? Th there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure on people to not be engaged or lose, the, but, but I do think that people who have that determination and dedication and knowledge will, will persevere and, and will keep pushing for, for, for what needs to be done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, this inspires me for next few months, just being with all of you. And, and good luck with everything you do. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be amazing.